RP Plus, welcome back. Dr. James Hoffman here, and today we're gonna kind of wet your whistle for a topic we're gonna talk about later, athlete testing and monitoring, another one of my favorite ones to talk about. So for today's lecture, what we're gonna talk about is just kind of a basic review of what athlete testing and monitoring is, kind of what the differences are between them, how we can evaluate some of the data that we've collected over time, how do we pick the right tests, and I'll give you some examples of what they might look like. Now later on, hopefully we're gonna have another huge lecture, excuse me, lecture series on testing and monitoring that's gonna go way deeper, but for now this is just meant to kind of get you excited Excited and introduced to this kind of more formalized concept of testing and monitoring. So let's go ahead and get started. So first question that you might have is why bother doing testing and monitoring at all, right? This is kind of one of those things I think a lot of people think about it and I think we pay a lot of lip service to, but we don't really do it for the right reasons. For lack of a better term, sometimes it can become a, a dick wagon contest where people just want to show off all these different tests that they do, all these different numbers that they collect but then they don't actually do anything with that data. So what is the point of doing all this data collection, testing and monitoring in the first place? The way I like to think about it is that testing and monitoring serves as kind of one of the central focal points of you being an evidence-based practitioner. This gives you the opportunity not only to look at the available science and the scientific papers that are out there, but allows you to actually do data collection on your own. You don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be a scientist to go and collect data and see if your things are working or if they're not working, right? You can be anybody, you can be a coach, trainer, strength coach, personal trainer, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? So this kind of gives you that opportunity to start actually doing a little bit of science in the field with your own clients. So why do we do testing and monitoring in the first place? Well, first off, it gives credibility to your program. You want to be able to establish not only just on a fundamental level that your program is working, but you actually want to have the numbers to back it up, right? Can't tell you how many times this comes up in the real world where maybe a sports team or an athlete's not having the best season that they've ever had, stinking on the field, who's the first person to the chopping block? Usually strength conditioning staff. One of the things that you wanna be able to document over time is, hey, you know what? My program has worked really well. I've done testing and monitoring. I can show you over time that athlete A or athlete B have been getting more muscular. They've gotten stronger. They've gotten more explosive. They've gotten leaner or more fatigue resistant, right? So from my end, they're definitely should be, they definitely should be improving, right? So if they're stinking on the field, it's not because they're not getting more fit. You want to be able to make that case for yourself and protect yourself in the long term. Also, it just looks good for you, right? No brainer there. We want to start figuring out what things work and what things don't work, right? That's part of the ongoing process of testing and monitoring. You might start implementing things that maybe you weren't sure if they were going to have a real positive impact or you weren't sure how to do it right. For example, like doing a resisted sled toe. You might be like, oh, I'm trying this workload that I saw in the paper, but I maybe want to try this other workload or I might want to try these weightlifting movements. How do you know if any of that stuff is having an effect on your athlete? Well, the only way to monitor those things is to measure those things, right? So that's how we're gonna figure out, is what I'm doing actually working? Is there no effect or is there potentially even a negative effect? Is are they actually getting worse after I've implemented different things or different changes, right? So sometimes those things are also really powerful. I think we get caught up too much on the positive effect, positive effect, positive effect. But an equally important component of testing and monitoring in what you're doing is sometimes no effect, like what I did basically yielded no change or no different results or maybe a negative effect and said, I, this made it worse, right? Now I know I can exclude this from now on because this clearly did not have the effect that I wanted. It was a negative effect. So those are all equally positive, in my opinion, getting a positive effect, no effect, or potentially even a negative effect because it allows you to start narrowing down what you're actually doing with your athletes and your clients. We wanna make sure that your program is quantitatively making your athlete bigger, faster, stronger, leaner, and more fatigue resistant, or any other combination of fitness variables that you wanna look at. But again, it's not just a qualitative thing where we're saying, well, they look like they're better, they look like they're leaner, they look like they can bench press more. No, we're actually able to document they've actually made physical, measurable improvements in all of the fitness characteristics that are gonna to lead to them being a successful athlete in whatever sport that they're in. So we need to actually measure those things over time and make sure that our programs are working. 
We can also start to figure out kind of some of the questions of our needs analysis, which was our first lecture way back when in this series, right? We can start figuring out how strong, how fast, how powerful is the person that I'm working with? Can I start figuring out, are they kind of trained or untrained or highly trained? Or what kind of things do I think that they're capable of doing? What kind of techniques are they able to do? What type of training should they be doing, right? So if we don't actually monitor them and measure them, there's no way for us to assess them. We can take their word for it, but let's face it, people tend to either lie or embellish a little bit. So we want our own objective way of identifying what we're working with with this particular athlete. And that comes as part of our needs analysis. So we can actually see right off the bat, needs analysis, testing and monitoring are already intertwined. So before you even get started, there's probably gonna be some type of assessment period with your athlete so you can figure out what it is that they are capable of doing at the current time. And then certainly, uh, we already kind of mentioned identifying factors that may negatively or positively affect performance. This can be any number of things, and I also like to include that no, no change effect, but we're going to be implementing things throughout the year with our athlete. We want to be able to validate those things and say, you know what, this strength program worked. This number of sets that I implemented or estimated to be around their MRV seems to be working. They seem to be training more and continuing to make positive improvements. These are examples of things that we need to assess continually, 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 and we can't just take it for granted, which is where I think a lot of people fall short, where they just say like, oh yeah, we collect numbers, we do testing, I do a one rep max every now and again, and we do jumps every now and again, but are you really using that number? Are you really using that data to drive your program? That's what evidence-based practice is. Let's go on to the next slide. So. We have these two terms, testing and monitoring. Hopefully you figured out they're two different words. They probably have two different meanings. Absolutely true. Are testing and monitoring always two distinctly different things? Not always. Sometimes they tend to overlap a little bit. We do have two distinct purposes for each of those things, and which we're going to get into later. When we're talking about testing, we're usually referring to, as you can see on the slide, a comprehensive evaluation of the athlete, generally using very, very precise laboratory equipment. Whereas monitoring, on the other hand, is a less comprehensive evaluation, usually done using simple field-based tests, right? So you can kind of think of testing as what we traditionally think of testing, where they go into a lab, they get the fancy equipment out, they take time out of their schedule, and we can hook them up to like a VO2 max or force plate analysis or anything like that. Whereas monitoring, on the other hand, we might not even ask them to do anything special for us. They might just show up to their normal practice, and in some cases, we might just actually collect numbers on them without asking asking them to do anything, or we might ask them to do something really, really simple, like do a sprint, do a jump, um, let me look at how much weight you're lifting, something like that. So monitoring is a much less invasive process where we're basically saying, hey, just do your normal thing, we're going to collect some data on your performance or what, on whatever that is you're, you're doing today. Let's go on to the next one. So we have two columns here. Here's just some examples of things that you can use in testing and monitoring. So if you look at the testing column, you can see we generally have more complicated tests on there, right? So we have hydrostatic weight, jumps on the force place, isometric squats or mid-thigh pulls, goniometry, uh, graded maximal exercise tests, 2D, 3D movement analyses. All of these things are great, right? They're really, really useful. Unfortunately, they are time consuming. Sometimes they require a lot of effort and you have to take the athlete sort of out of their element, which is their normal training, practice, uh, and recovery time to do this laboratory style testing. It also takes you as the sport coach or the strength coach or the sport scientist out of your element for a little while because now you have to, instead of hanging out with your athletes or training them or assessing them, you have to go and assess all this laboratory numbers that you've collected, and then you have to go into data analysis on it later. So it tends to be kind of a, a big process. Not to say that it's right or wrong, but it's just more involved on everybody's part, right? Whereas monitoring, on the other hand, you can see we have much easier tests. We have things like sprints, agility, dynamic strength, jumps on a switch mat, session RPE, skin folds, body weights, stuff like that. Really, really simple and easy to measure. Most of these things you can measure out on the field or with very, very minimally invasive techniques, right? So asking the athlete to measure their body weight instead of going in and doing a bod pod or hydrostatic weight, really, really easy, right? Just keeping track of their lifting numbers, right? Their dynamic strength, like how much they lift for threes and fives versus having them do a 1RM or a uh, maximal isometric pull on a force plate. We can see the difference there, right? One of them requires quite a bit of effort on everyone's part. The other is pretty easy and that's something that they're probably already doing, right? So we can kind of see the invasiveness on both sides. However, we want to keep in mind, 
testing is probably going to give us some really cool and unique data that we would not otherwise get with monitoring. The limitation on monitoring is it's easy, less invasive, but we're not going to get really, really precise measurements. We might not get that many variables. Testing, on the other hand, because we have that cool laboratory equipment, we can get really, really precise measurements on some really, really whacked out variables. Make sense? All right, let's go on to the next one. So are there any kind of testing and monitoring methods that maybe are in a gray area, they kind of fall between the two? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a whole bunch of different ones that might not fit exactly that, that model of testing or monitoring. A couple that come to mind, <coughs> burping. The other one, surveys. Sometimes surveys can be really quick and easy, can be like a five point Likert scale, five question survey. Sometimes they can be massive hour long ordeals like the, uh, I believe the Rescue and some other ones like the Dalda. They're humongous and they take a long time. Surveys are generally good for both testing and monitoring. How you use them is kind of up to you and what, uh, what you think your athletes are willing to tolerate kind of day to day, week to week, month to month. Some surveys are massive and they will take upwards of an hour, but they can be very, very powerful in terms of predicting things like illness and potential for injury or poor performance. Other ones can be really, really short and simple and might be good for using just quick assessments of, are my athletes kind of where I want them to be right now or does something seem to be a little, little awry, something that I should look into. Uh, skin fold analysis, you do need a set of calipers and you do need a little bit of experience using them. It does take you know a little bit of time, especially the first couple times that, you've, that you do it. But once you get kind of seasoned in the skin fold analysis, you can kind of knock them out in like 10 minute pops. It's really, really easy to run through a whole team. It's kind of somewhere in that gray area, right? It gives you a pretty good measure, but maybe not as good as some other testing methods like a DEXA scan, right? But still pretty good. So that's kind of right in between. Hydration's another one where you actually need to have a urinary specific gravity refractometer, right? Which is not the most expensive thing in the world. It's not the hardest thing in the world to do, but you do need to have them pee in a cup. You need to take the sample of the pee and take a look at it, right? Sometimes it's brown and nasty. It looks like the plague. Other times it's fine. Other times people hand you pee that's ice cold. Hmm. I wonder where that came from, drinking fountain, right? So hydration is another one that we want to incorporate in there. It maybe is kind of a gray area between testing and monitoring. And then last on the list, jumps and sprints, right? Jumps and sprints are probably some of the best, best, best indices of just general athlete performance, meaning just how athletic they are in general. We can look at them on really, really, really finite scales or really, really gross scales, right? So we can just look at something as simple as doing like a Vertec or like a 10 meter sprint with a stopwatch still very useful, but we could also look at things like jumps on a force plate, or we could do sprints using infrared, um, I forgot what the thing's called, but there's all sorts of devices that can measure like ground contacts, foot speed, all sorts of crazy stuff, right? So there are different ways to assess those exact same tests, depending on how deeply you want to delve into them. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so what is the point of collecting all of this data, right? We're saying it's not just for showboating. It's not just to say, look at all the cool tools I have. The data that we're collecting is gonna be the driving force behind how we set up our training program. Remember in the needs analysis lecture, we said from the needs analysis, we should be able to determine the normative standards of success for any given sport for our kind of athlete, excuse me, athlete demographic that we're working with. So we need to look at what does my athlete need to be successful? How high should they jump? How fast should they sprint? How strong should they be? Testing and monitoring is how we figure out how close they are to those normative standards, right? Now, how we go about that is slightly different from testing and monitoring. So if we're looking at testing, and this is the way I like to think about it, testing is a periodic evaluation to determine if an athlete's physical characteristics are approaching that of established normative values for success, meaning, are my athletes as big, fast, strong, uh, uh, fatigue resistant as a comparable group, right? So if I'm working in division one men's soccer, is my men's soccer player as strong, as fast as other people in that same demographic, right? Monitoring on the other hand is a continuous process of evaluating an athlete's training stress, physiological state, psychological state, and performance capabilities. Now we can see a big difference right off the bat, right? Testing is periodic, meaning not done a lot, maybe two to three times a year, whereas monitoring is a continuous process, meaning we do it all the time, possibly as frequently as day to day, right? So we already have a time scale difference. We're also looking at, with testing, are they reaching those determined values? Whereas monitoring, we're kind of trying to figure out are they in a state that is acceptable for the current time? 
So let's look into it a little bit more. We're going to break these down into some more specific questions. So if we're looking at testing, there's two big questions that we should seek to answer with our testing protocol. Has my training program been effective, first of all? So that's kind of a quick yes or no. And that's something we can look at is, am I making them stronger, faster, more fatigue resistant, or whatever it is that we were working on? Number two, how do the results compare to normative standards, right? How close is my athlete to being competitive on all the fitness characteristics and variables that you're looking at? Now, the way that we do that is by looking at really, really precise measurements. There's all sorts of things you can look at for testing, and I've just listed a few on here. For example, looking at things like rate of force development, peak force, VO2 max, impulse, Really, really hard to measure without some really, really fancy laboratory equipment, right? And again, it's not something that we do all the time. It's something that we do maybe a couple times per year at the most. But again, has my training program been effective? How do the results compare to normative standards of performance? Those are the two big ones for testing. Let's look at monitoring. Very similar, but slightly different. So the two big questions for monitoring are, is the athlete in an acceptable training state? And this can be both physically and psychologically. And then, number two, are changes to the training plan warranted? So the first one is a very powerful question, right? Is the athlete in an acceptable training state? Meaning, for whatever you're doing right now, are they in an okay state? We know that throughout the annual plan, our athletes might be in varying degrees of fatigue and recovery, right? So there might be some times, like if they're doing a hypertrophy uh, overreaching week, and they scored really, really high on a fatigue survey, you might initially think, ooh, that's bad, right? They're really, really fatigued. But at the same time, they're in their overreaching hypertrophy block. Like, of course, they're really, really fatigued. So you might actually say, you know what? I planned this. This is actually what I expected them to be at at this time. Is my athlete in an acceptable training state? Yes. Are train uh, excuse me, changes to the training plan warranted? not at the current time, right? And there's a number of different ways that you can go about that depending on what you're measuring. But that is something that we need to keep reassessing day to day, week to week. Is my athlete in an acceptable state, both physically and psychologically? We can evaluate them kind of collectively and independently. Either way, we want to make an assessment and see, are they where, excuse me, are they where they are supposed to be? And then we can ask, are changes to the plan warranted. But again, in order for changes to be warranted, we have to have some type of measurable change in either performance, physiology, or psychology that seems to indicate that they are not where they need to be. Now for monitoring, we're not gonna be using crazy, crazy precise measurements like we did for testing. We might just look at things like simple surveys, body weights, jumping ability, sprinting ability, and maybe just something like perception of fatigue, something like that, really, really easy. Again, not the most precise, not the most um, crazy, crazy specific measurements, but still useful nonetheless. And again, we're not trying to determine the exact change in body fat with this assessment. We're just trying to figure out, is my athlete where they're supposed to be, right? So it's a more generalized assessment. All right, let's move on to the next one. So when we have collected all this data, we have to start figuring out some of these questions. Are they in an acceptable training state? Is my athlete improving in their fitness characteristics towards the normative standards? How do we do that? Well, we have to evaluate those numbers somehow, right? In sport and exercise sciences, we have a couple big tools that we rely on very heavily. We kind of have some quantitative ones and some qualitative ones. So for testing, we typically rely a little bit more on quantitative analysis. Not to say that we can't use qualitative, but it's just harder to actually make a really precise qualitative assessment, right? So for testing, we use a little bit more quantitative measures. A couple things that we use, things like t-tests and ANOVAs, which are really, really simple statistical tests that take groups, means of groups, and they basically try to figure out how much do those groups overlap, right? So if the groups overlap a lot, like this, it basically means that they're not significantly different from each other, or if they are distinctly different, they don't overlap, then the test usually says they are significantly different from each other. And this can be done on a number of different levels. We can just look at pre, post training kind of stuff. We can look at multiple dependent variables. It doesn't matter, but it's a tool that basically says, are these two groups or multiple groups different from each other? And we can figure it out from there. Another one that we use a lot is correlations. And this is basically just trying to see how much do changes in one variable account for changes in another variable. And this is something really, really simple you can do in Microsoft Excel using a, a linear regression equation, which is really, really easy. Correlations do not give us cause and effect relationships, but they give us strong relationship uh, characteristics, meaning if I get a very strong correlation, there's a very good chance that whatever my x variable was 
has a very strong effect on my y variable, my dependent variable, right? So not to say that it's a perfect relationship, but we use it a lot to establish relationships between things. For example, like leg strength and jumping and sprinting ability, something along those lines, right? For monitoring, on the other hand, we do use a little bit more qualitative analysis, but we can still use quantitative at the same time. One of the most powerful ones for monitoring does not require a lot of math, does not require a lot of measurements, and I would argue is probably one of the most useful ones out there, is simply just observation, which is kind of a key foundational component of the scientific process anyway. You don't necessarily need to do a 2D or 3D movement analysis to see that your athlete's technique is all out of whack. They're not sprinting properly. They're not tackling properly. They're not shooting a layup properly. Any of those things. How can you determine that? Well, your coach's eye is probably pretty good at stuff like that. Do you necessarily need to see uh, numbers that validate that your athlete is totally dragging ass during this training session. No, you can see it for yourself, right? Observation does go a long way. Obviously, we would like some numbers to back that up too, but don't shy away from observation. Usually your gut instincts are probably pretty good, probably on point, especially if you've been involved in your sport or activity or training, whatever it is for a long time. If you see it, you notice it, it's worth bringing up and it's worth noting, right? Outside of that, we can start using things like trend analysis. We can start looking at changes in certain variables over time, right? Are variables going up? Are they staying flat? Are they going down? Body weight's a really great example on this one. If they are gaining weight, right, we can just look at body weight over time and we see, okay, if the trend is upward, then they're gaining weight. Didn't need anything crazy for that. If the trend is flat, they're not gaining weight, right? And if the trend is downward, they're losing weight. No surprise there. And you can use that same idea for any number of variables. And then one of my favorite, which we'll just give a really brief, quick synopsis of here, is a process I like to, we like to call statistical process control, which is kind of a fancy way of setting boundaries on a lot of your variables. So let's go to the next slide. I really like this method because one of the questions and one of the problems that you run into when you're assessing your variables, especially for monitoring, is I don't really know what an acceptable number is or what is an acceptable range of numbers to operate in for this particular variable. Whatever it is, can be heart rate, can be jump height, can be uh, number of efforts, it can be GPS data, whatever, right? Sometimes it's hard to figure out like what is an okay state or what is an okay number for my athlete. Statistical process control is a really, really handy way of setting upper and lower bounds for our monitoring program. So we can do this with any variable that you want to look at. Some are probably more meaningful than others, but you can pick and choose whatever you want. Essentially what we're going to do is start collecting some baseline data on our athlete or our client, whatever it is, right? And that's usually going to be anywhere between two and maybe upwards of four weeks, right? We're just going to see kind of what is normal for this variable for my athlete and we're going to establish a mean value and that's going to be our baseline. So that means on average for any given time I would expect my athlete's heart rate or that I expect their jump height to be this, right? Once we've established that, we're going to set some upper and lower bounds. The way that we generally do that is by using the standard deviation of that mean that we established. So you can see in my little chart here, the blue line represents data points. You can see the blue dots and the lines that are all squiggly, right? The green line represents the mean of that individual, so what on average we would expect to see. And then the dark red lines are the upper and lower bounds set by the standard deviations. Now. The question then becomes, how many standard deviations do we generally use to set upper and lower bounds? If I only use one standard deviation, <coughs> excuse me, I burp a little bit. If I only use one standard deviation, I might start getting kind of false positives, right? Where I just start to see a lot of things exiting and entering my upper and lower bounds too frequently, and I might not be able to determine if that's okay or not. It's just gonna be kind of showing me data outside of my range maybe a little too frequently. Whereas on the other hand, if I use like upwards of three standard deviations, I might not get anything to ever register outside of my upper and lower bounds simply because the range is too large, right? Because now I might be getting false negatives, right? Where something might be happening that I can't actually pick up on because my boundaries are too big. So typically what we use is somewhere around two standard deviations from the mean, which seems to be kind of a happy place where it's not so small that we get lots of noise, but it's enough to kind of differentiate bad data points from the normal data points. So let's go on to the next slide. Again, this is kind of just reiterating that same idea. We're going to collect data, get that baseline data on our athlete. That's going to be our mean. We're going to be setting our upper and lower bounds probably around two standard deviations away from that mean. And then we're just going to start plotting our data for that variable over time. Now, we want to just make sure that we don't jump the gun 
when we see a data point that's maybe not exactly where we want it to be. The upper and lower bounds are useful, but just because we have one data point that pops out of our upper and lower bounds doesn't mean we have to jump to alarm and stop everything that we're doing, right? Typically using this analysis, you wanna see kind of a trend of data points exiting your upper and lower bounds. So one point outside, that person might have just been having a bad day, maybe they were dogging a little bit, maybe their girlfriend died, who knows? Any number of things could have happened, right? But now we start to see two, three, four points outside of our upper or lower bounds. Now we can see there's a trend indicating that this person is really deviating outside of their normal resting condition and maybe I should take some action, right? So that goes back to monitoring and we say, is my athlete in an acceptable training state? I now have four data points outside of my upper bounds. You can make a strong case and say, you know what? No, this is not acceptable. Our, training, our changes to the training plan warranted in this case Yes, I need to address whatever's happening with my athlete and make sure I get them back to where I want them to be. So that's kind of a nice quantitative way of going about that process. So we can use this for whatever variables that you want. It's really, really easy and quick to set up. Let's go to the next one. So we need to start figuring out what types of tests and what type of monitoring tools we are going to be using for any given athlete or for our clients, right? We need to start figuring out which tests should we do. So I'm gonna give you some examples of specific tests that we should include, but basically all sports, all activities, personal training, what have you, should at least have some of the following in there in some capacity. It doesn't have to be overwhelmingly perfect, but you should address a few things, right? One, anthropometry, particularly things like body weight, right? If you're working with somebody who is uh, of developmental age, their limbs might be changing, their height might be changing. Those things might be worth noting. If you're working with an adult, their limb lengths, their height's probably not gonna be changing much, probably not at all. Um, so that might not be necessary, but certainly things like body weight, you can also include things like body circumference measurements in there possibly. Hydration is always important, right? You should always be assessing hydration in some capacity because we know it has a direct relationship with performance. Some type of body composition assessment, it doesn't always have to be DEXA or bod pod or anything like that, even skin fold or even just BIA every now and again. It's better than nothing, absolutely. And then, of course, I'm not a psychologist. I don't claim to know a lot about psychology. However, I do think it is worth having some type of psychological assessment, even if it's just perceptive, perception, excuse me, perceptive measures should be in there in some capacity, whether it's something that is your forte or not, it should be there, right? Now, let's go into some more specific things. We should have some type of assessment of maximal strength. We know that strength is probably one of the most important things in all of sport. It's the underlying physical, uh, excuse me, fitness characteristic for virtually everything. I would go as far as to say everything. So we need to be able to assess maximal strength in some capacity, right? Really, really easy way to do that is just through dynamic strength tests, right? Having somebody do like a one to anywhere between about three repetition max test. Now, typically if you go through the research, you'll typically see squat, bench press, Every now and again, you'll see a power clean for some sports like volleyball, and then rarely, but on occasion, you'll see something like a deadlift, but almost squat and bench, a one to three RM, very, very common across most sports, right? Now, is this something that you necessarily need to test, in my humble opinion? No. This is something that you can probably do really, really well with, with monitoring. There's only a few sports where actually doing like 1RM testing is warranted, and this is just my humble opinion. Uh, I would say powerlifting, when you have your powerlifting meets, weightlifting, when you have your weightlifting meets, and then strongman in some capacity, right? Other sports, you probably don't necessarily need to be doing one to three RM tests, though it still could be valuable from a testing and monitoring perspective. A couple other things that you can look at are doing isometric maximal strength tests. Now, these can be hit or miss, excuse me, hit or miss, depending on how you use them and how you assess them. However, they are, uh, they are worthwhile in the sense that there is data normative standards used to back up their use. So it can be used effectively to compare with your athletes. So you can see in the picture here, we have somebody doing an isometric mid-thigh pull standing on two force plates. If you've never done that test before, it is brutal. Your knees, your shoulders, your neck, it's going to be blown up for a couple of days, which, you know, again, presents the question of, do I really need this data if it's gonna take my, I have to plan a day for them to come in and do this test, and then it's gonna take them out of commission for a couple days as well. You could make a strong case either way. Now the data could be useful, but you have to weigh the cost of actually taking the time out to do the test. There's no right or wrong answer, it's up for you to decide. 
Another one we can look at is an isometric squat, which is basically the same setup in here, except they're loading it up in a high bar squat position, usually knees set around 90 degrees or so. Also really brutal if you've never done that one before. All right, let's go to the next one. Usually we have some type of assessment of power and explosiveness. Usually we want to kind of vector these out a little bit so we can usually break down our assessment into vertical uh, power assessments and horizontal power assessments. So for vertical, hands down, by far, can't go wrong, jumps. Jumps are wonderful, really, really good indice of performance and can be used very effectively for testing and monitoring. Typically we're gonna use things like vertical jumps, either uh, counter movement jumps, which are just done at a standing position, the athlete can jump as high as they want, however they want, or static or squat jumps where they start at 90 degrees and do a concentric only jump up. This can be done weighted or unweighted, really, really good data and tons of it's out there for, for comparison. Another one in that direction is actually looking at bench throws for a lot of sports. They see that one reoccurring a lot where they actually do kind of like a modified bench press, sometimes on a Smith machine, sometimes on a special apparatus where they actually lay down and throw the barbell or an implement up as high as they can. And they usually look at the bar displacement and they can look at the velocity and power output of the movement. On the other end, we can look at horizontal power, right? So this is usually looking at things like jumps uh, in the horizontal direction, like bounds or skips and uh, sprints, of course. Sprints probably being the better option. Usually with sprints, we're looking at mostly shorter distance sprints for most sports, with the exception of long track and field events. Uh, most team sports, the average sprint distance is usually somewhere around 20 meters or less. So a lot of the times doing like the 30 or 40 meter sprint assessment might not actually even be necessary since most sports like soccer, rugby, basketball, field hockey, on average, they usually move anywhere between zero and 20 meters for most efforts. Now there are, there are times where they break over that and do a much longer sprint. The question is how useful is that data to you? So I usually write down something like five, 10, 20, 30, and maybe upwards of 40 meters, but probably not much more than that, unless they're doing like track and field or something like that, right? There are some other tests that you can do, the power endurance tests. These are ones that I do not like to use. I have seen other people use them. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the Bosco test, which is a vertical jump test that is done, I believe it's done for like a minute or two, and it's basically maximal vertical jumps until more or less failure. Brutal, 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 brutal. It can give you some good data on the uh, amount of power drop off from repeated maximal efforts. However, your athlete is going to be out of commission for like a week. It's gnarly. So use with discretion. Okay, next slide. A couple other ones we can look at. Agility tests for a lot of field and team sports. This can be useful for other sports, maybe not so much. Some really simple ones like reactive agility where they're given a cue. They have to respond to either a color or a sound or a movement and they have to change direction. Some other common ones, 505, pro agility, T-tests. And every now and again, you'll see some real sports specific ones like this particular soccer, a particular basketball type test, and all of those are fine. And then certainly we wanna have some type of conditioning or metabolic test. Now, this is really where you have to keep in mind the specificity of your sport. So more often than not, what you'll see are peak power and VO2 max type tests, which for some sports might be applicable like an endurance sport. However, it does require a lot of equipment. It's gonna take a day out of their, um, life just to actually do the test and then it's gonna be very, very fatiguing. They're gonna make a true maximal effort on that treadmill or on that bike and they are gonna be out of commission. So just keep that in mind. Other tests have similar problem, doing like the Wingate, it's a maximal anaerobic test. I had a student who ate like a box of Pop-Tarts this last year and decided to do the Wingate test. You can imagine how colorful the room ended up after that, it was not good. And there are some other ones that are actually very useful. Uh, ones that I actually recommend are time trials. Time trials are really, really good for assessing endurance performance because they actually directly assess the sport itself, right? So endurance sport, you are doing some type of distance, trying to get it in the lowest completion time possible. You can actually do time trials to mimic those conditions and you get a very, very direct measure of performance of their, not only of their actual field performance, but their conditioning metabolic uh, capacity as well. There are some sub-maximal ones out there, like some shuttle runs, some th functional threshold tests. However, I have not used those with as much success, not to say that they can't be used. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. So we know that for monitoring, a lot of these tests may overlap a little bit, and we're gonna kind of vary them in the degree of frequency and invasiveness. So we don't wanna necessarily pick tests for monitoring 
that we have already done for testing because it just ends up being redundant and overly complicated for no, no benefit. So when we're doing monitoring, we kind of have a standard thing that we want to hit, and that's, again, some type of anthropometry assessment, some type of body comp assessment, assessment, some type of psychological survey, so basically the same as testing, just a little bit less comprehensive. And then last but not least, what we must have for monitoring, and this is kind of the differentiating factor from training, or excuse me, from testing, is the training numbers. Training numbers absolutely must be a part of monitoring. Now, this can be all sorts of stuff, right? It can be on-field performance if you have like GPS data, which is difficult to use, but very useful. It can be their strength numbers. It can be their sprinting numbers, their jumping numbers, their practice numbers. You need their training numbers. Whatever it is that they're doing in training, you should be keeping really, really detailed logs so that over time you can actually say, has my athlete gotten faster? Has they got, have they gotten stronger? You know, in... Last year, they were squatting uh, for fives, 225. Now, a year later, for fives, they're squatting 235, 240. Did they get stronger? Well, for my monitoring program, I didn't need to do a one rep max, but I know that their fives have gone up, therefore they have gotten stronger. I didn't need to do a really formal assessment of that. Really, really easy. And it did not take any extra effort on the behalf of the athlete. All it took was a little bit of effort on your end to keep some good records of what was going on. All right, let's go on to the next one. So for monitoring, generally we're going to just look at general strength. We're just going to be collecting the strength as their uh, numbers of their training program. We're not going to be doing really, really hyper-specific strength assessment. We're just going to have them do their normal strength training program. It should be progressively overloaded over time anyway, as a good program should be, right? And then we're going to make sure that their numbers are improving over time. So simple thing like trend analysis or even like a t-test over time will indicate that they have gotten stronger or hopefully has, they have gotten stronger. For power and explosiveness, we can look at things like vertical jumps. Usually we'll use something like a switch mat, jump mat, a vertex, or you can even go old school with chalk on the hand, touch the wall, better than nothing, really, really easy to assess. Can do same thing, static and counter movement jumps, nothing different there. And then one that people use a lot are med ball tosses, and all you need is a ruler, really, to get that, or a measuring tape. Toss the med ball, see how far it goes, mark it accurately, no big deal there. And then some other horizontal ones, Typically, we're going to be looking at jumps and bounds and sprints with probably sprints being the more preferred method. And again, this can be done with a stopwatch and measuring tape. You don't have to have an infrared uh, timing gate system to get this going. You can just have them run 10 meters, stopwatch, and just keep some numbers on that. Now, again, it's limited in the sense that it's not going to be as accurate as using an infrared, but it's still going to give you a pretty good idea of where they are currently at. So very, very useful nonetheless. Next slide. For conditioning metabolic, typically this is not something that you're going to be doing a lot of with monitoring. There are some things you can do. There's some functional threshold tests, some repeated sprint tests, and then actually I would say doing their time trials, again, is probably a better idea. For anaerobic sports, like team sports, strength power sports, I would say probably don't need to do a lot of conditioning metabolic testing and monitoring. Probably can use things like their sprinting and their um, gameplay performance is probably going to be really, really good. Whereas for endurance sports, again, time trials, time trials, time trials. It's something that they're going to be doing anyway, keeping track of like their race pace times, um, mile times, things like that, lap times. Really, really useful. Does not require super formal assessment. Next slide. So here's just some examples of what this might look like in the real world. Don't take these overly literally. There's just some examples that I have pulled so that you can see what this might look like. So in our first example here, we have basketball. We basically split this up either into three days or maybe two days with one of those days being an AM and PM style testing session, right? So the first session that we're going to do, really, really simple. We're just going to do anthropometry. So things like height, weight, seven side skin fold, nothing crazy there. Second session, they'll come in. We'll do some jumps, some sprints, like a 5, 10, 20 meter sprint, some sit and reach, uh, and then maybe some basketball specific drills and a conditioning yo yo test, which is a um, kind of like the beep test. If you've ever had the presidential fitness challenge, the beep test where all your friends threw up and then you made fun of them the rest of their life, that one, right? Same idea. And then the last session is going to be kind of our uh, strength and power uh, session, or, or actually more just strength session, where we'll just do some like three RM squats, three RM bench press. No big deal. Can you cram all of those into one mega session? Yes. Good luck, especially if you're working with a basketball team that has, you know, maybe 20, 25 guys on there. That's going to take you all day to do that. So probably a better way to do that is have them come in in kind of waves and split it up into multiple sessions. That way it's not unnecessarily grueling for all of them and for you as well. All right, let's look at the next example. My favorite, can't get out of it, can't get away from it, rugby union, not rugby league, weirdos. Rugby Union, 
what do we got here? So for rugby, we might do same thing. Three days uh, testing session. First day, we might just do some anthros, some vertical jumps, some sprints, and then the yo-yo test is actually a good one for rugby as well. Sometimes you'll see it the yo-yo one or the yo-yo IR two specifically for rugby. So again, height, weight, seven side skin fold. And then for rugby, because Certain positions do have standards of body weight. We might actually look at something like lean body mass. Rugby is a strength sport, and a lot of those guys actually need to be really big and really muscular, so actually monitoring their lean body mass over time might be a good idea. We might just do some squat jumps and some counter movement jumps. Squat jumps, I don't know how much I buy into it, but some have suggested that it's more similar to the uh, scrumming position where you have to start in that crouched position and then do a concentric only explosion. Maybe, maybe not, not sure, but still worth measuring. And then we'll do some sprints, 10 and 40 meters. Again, most of the rugby type activities, usually somewhere around zero to 20 meters with 40 meters being kind of on the upper end. So we have our short measurement and a longer measurement. And then we have that metabolic assessment. Day two, we'll just come in and do some strength. We might do a one RM squat, bench. And then for whatever reason, you'll see this one. I don't think it's a good one necessarily, but you'll see it in the research is a prone grip chin up. I have no idea why it's in there, but it keeps coming up. So every, and this is why I'm bringing this up because you should be skeptical when you see some of these things. So when you're looking through the normative standards, you might see some goofy stuff every now and again. And I always read rugby ones and I always see this prone grip chin up and I'm like, why is that in there? What, who cares, right? So squat and bench, probably really, really good, right? And then day three, one that you'll probably see a lot is a repeated sprint ability test or what I like to call repeated effort ability where in this case, typically they'll do like a six times 30 meter sprint with an incomplete rest in between. They'll look at how fast they run the first sprint and they'll look at the speed and power drop off of each subsequent sprint. So it's kind of like a power endurance style test. Okay, let's go to the next one. A little bit different than what we've been talking about, triathlon. Again, probably a pretty good idea to split this up into multiple sessions because as you'll see, all these tests are pretty grueling. So the day one, uh, first session, we might actually do our swim assessment, usually somewhere around a one kilometer swim. You can actually break that up into laps. So a lot of times you'll see like zero to 200, 200 to 400, four to six, six to eight, eight to one, zero to one, thousand all the way up through there. You can actually look at completion time, their heart rate, and believe it or not, you can do heart rate underwater. You can look at their stroke rate, stroke count, things like that. Absolutely. Day two, we can kind of split into multiple sessions or we can do one. We can see some different cycle power profiles. So a lot of the ones you'll see a lot are similar to like the Lambert cycling test where they'll cycle at like 60, 80, 90% of their max heart rate. They'll make a power output assessment of those submaximal workloads. And then eventually they'll move into the maximal effort test, which is a peak power test, very similar to how they do VO2 max on a treadmill, right? Where they'll ride up and it can be ramp or stepwise ramp up as high as they go, high as they go, high as they go, get the peak sustainable power really, really useful test. And then on the third day, you might do that same exact test on the treadmill for the person where you get VO2 max, peak running speed, time to fatigue, lactate, all that other stuff, right? So again, can you do them all on the same day? Yeah, but you better believe that the last two <laughs> uh, tests you do are gonna be totally squashed, right? So it's probably good to split those up into multiple days. Okay, I think last but not least, one that near and dear to all of our hearts at RP, volleyball, team that we love to work with. So another good one to split it up just because the tests are inherently hard. So day one, we might do some anthros, right? Height, body weight, seven side skin fold, nothing crazy there. Usually we'll look at some jumps. Now volleyball, you can see a little bit crazier jump analysis if you look through some of the papers. Usually they do some type of counter movement jump. Usually you'll see some type of depth jump somewhere in there. And then every now and again, you'll see a spike jump, which is kind of more of a, they try to make it a more volleyball specific jump where they run up to a point and jump up as if they were gonna spike the ball and they measure the jump height, things like that. We're also gonna look on a different session, power and strength. Typically you'll see a one, this is one of those where you'll see a power clean pop up every now and again, and then like a three RM squat, three RM bench. And then last but not least, you will see some volleyball repeated effort. Now these repeated effort, like sports specific tests, again, be skeptical, make sure that they've been validated to some capacity. So sometimes you'll see just like Joe Blow soccer test or James Hoffman stupid rugby test, right? You shouldn't just look at that and accept it at face value and say, oh, this is a great assessment of volleyball or of rugby performance, right? It should be validated. But volleyball is one where I have seen this come up more often than not. So there are volleyball specific uh, kind of repeated effort tests where they do like a run, jump, back up, move around, bump a ball, spike a ball, kind of repeat type thing. Usually what they look at is like the number of jumps, number of uh, time completed and like the percent drop off in each lap that they do or something like that. So be skeptical, but that's not to say that there aren't ones out there that are useful. And then last but not least, just keep in mind, right? 
A lot of people get on this kick of testing super, super frequently where they might test their athletes every two or three months or so with some of these lab tests, and that comes at a big cost, right? At the very least, it's just taking away time from their training regimen. Uh, at worst, it's taking away time not only from training, but time from recovery from really, really hard training, right? So you want to find that sweet spot where we're using the testing. The testing is giving us meaningful quantitative data that is telling us, is my athlete progressing in the way that they're supposed to, approaching or maybe hopefully even exceeding those normative standards of performance? And then if I can rely on my, my monitoring methods, my continuous assessment methods, I won't have to pull them out of their element quite so frequently. I won't have to take them off of the pitch or off of the court as frequently, and I can still get valuable numbers. So what is the right answer? There is no right answer. It's up to you and your athletes to figure out kind of what is that sweet spot in your relationship where you're getting the data that you need and you're not interfering with their training program. So again, I like to reinforce that testing and monitoring is kind of the central part of good evidence-based practice. We have science available to us, but science doesn't always answer all the questions. So we need to be able to rely on our own data that we have collected with ourselves and our clients to fall back on and say, you know what? I didn't know, I tried, I got a result. And at least I can mark it down and say yes, no, or maybe, right? So we always wanna make sure that testing and monitoring is driving all the changes and, and major milestones of our training program. Guys, I hope you enjoyed my little blurb on testing and monitoring. We're gonna have another big series on this in the future, so if this is something that really tickles your fancy, stay tuned in the future. RP Plus will have more to come on testing and monitoring. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you guys next time.